And um, for the meeting of today, uh, we thought to the word creativity. Uh, to me, this meeting, it is very special since I know Julian Racklin since more than 20 years, I would say. It was uh, 1997 when, when we met the first time. And uh, Julian has been to me a wonderful friend and uh, a big source of inspiration through all my uh, musical journey. Julian is not only a wonderful violinist, not only a wonderful violist, but through the years he created a music life for a lot of people. He is a wonderful chamber music uh, musician. He, he created festivals where let people meet together and create through the music, create uh, friendship, create uh, beauty in life through friendship and uh, friendship and music. He uh, stimulated a lot of new works for the chamber music for story. I think he is a very generous uh, person, musically and humanly. And when I invited him to, to join this adventure, very strange for all of us because we are musicians, we are not used to, to talk, but we are used to play and to talk to each other through the music. Of course, he reacted in a very uh, excited and positive way and generous way as usual. And uh, uh, he told me, you know what I, I love music and I love people. So I try to, to live this passion uh, in my life every day. And for me, this was a very wonderful reaction, answer and the feedback from him that we were doing uh, the right thing to think to this uh, very ambitious and uh, uh, unusual project. So I'm uh, very, very happy to to welcome Julian, but before giving him the, the microphone, I want to thank you again, our friend Andrea Milanesi uh, and Amadeus, our media partner, for joining us and uh, travel with us in this uh, wonderful experience. So Andrea, I give you the microphone and uh, let's start this wonderful journey of today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Francesco. It's a pleasure for me to discover together with all the friends of the Mac Academy, which are the milestone of the hero's journey of Julian Racklin. So which are the landmarks that have marked his artistic life, but also his private life. So it's the ordinary life of an extraordinary musician, a master of creativity. So I would like to know First of all, when when did you uh, recognize? When did the call arrive to you? When did your hero's journey start? I never consider myself as a hero. I'm just an ordinary, uh, ordinary human, and which had the luck to have to be born into a beautiful family with wonderful parents, supporting, loving. They never loved me because I had a talent or because they wanted me to be somebody. They just uh, simply uh, wanted their child to be healthy and happy. I think like all of our parents, or hopefully all of our parents. And it happened completely uh, naturally. Uh, there was never the point for me when I said, I want to be a musician because when you are two and a half years old, mm -hmm. you, uh, you don't make such decisions. <laughs> I couldn't even speak. Uh, I started speaking very late in my life. I think I was, my mother had to go to the doctor because she was uh, very nervous why her son 
he was two and a half, he still didn't speak, but he was already crazy about music. <laughs> and um, I started speaking very late. The doctor said, Mrs. Rachlin, don't worry, your son is going to speak so much, you will be sick of it. <laughs> so enjoy the last moments of silence. But uh, to come back to your question, mm. uh, music was always around because my father is a cellist, my mother is a, a conducting teacher and a pianist. So of course music was around and one day my parents came back with uh, the recording of a Dvorak Cello Concerto. It was a new release in 1976. It's a very famous recording of the Dvorak Cello Concerto with uh, uh, Rostropovich uh, playing and um, Berlin Philharmonic under Herbert von Karajan. We all know this recording. And uh, when I heard this uh, Dvorak Concerto for the very first time, I uh, I took an umbrella, which was my cello, and I took uh, some kind of stick that was the bow. Uh, I was two and a half years old, and I started to play along the LP. And uh, when the last chord of the concerto, when the piece finished, because I couldn't talk, I pointed with my finger to the LP player because I wanted to hear the piece again from the beginning to the end, and it continued the whole day, every day. So my parents cannot listen to this piece anymore. They are traumatized by the Dvorak Cello Concerto. And I guess this was the time when everything was decided, because ever since then, for me, music was the most exciting uh, thing, uh, and until today. And thank God my parents never took me serious, at that time, uh, I mean, they never took it serious that I wanted to do music. And uh, actually, in my heart, until today, I'm a cellist. <laughs> For me, the violin is not my favorite instrument. <laughs> That's why I play viola, because viola is the closest that I can get to the cello as a violinist. It's the only chance. But of course, now, uh, since I started conducting, uh, it's a wonderful opportunity. Uh, I program the Dvorja Concerto all the time. <laughs> so, but I also made a transcription uh, before I, like 20 years ago, I transcribed the cello concerto for viola and orchestra. And I asked okay. my dear friend, the great Misha Maisky, if it's okay to play, and I actually asked Rostropovich if it's okay to play the cello concerto on the viola. And Rostropovich said, yes, yes, you should do it. And, and Misha said, oh, yeah, you should try. And uh, so I tried, I played it a few times, but I realized it's a little bit ridiculous, you know, to play the cello concerto on the viola. I just wanted to be near to this piece that made a musician out of me. And, also, Rostropovich, I told him the story. He knew that I became musician in a way because of him. And it, uh, there was never the question. It was never the point to be a musician or not to be a musician until I was about 10, 11 years old when I was very much in love with football. So I asked my parents if I can be uh, also a great football player at the same time as to be a good musician. <laughs> and they said, it's very, it, it's a very interesting, like we like that you want to do lots of different things, but to answer your question, no. <laughs> you have to decide. But again, they never forced me, they never told me what I have to do, they never wanted uh, to me to achieve maybe what they didn't achieve, seeing that there was a talent there. And I had to beg my parents until I was six years and nine months old. So nearly seven years. Only then I received my first teacher. And it was not on the cello. That is another conversation that we can have another day. Yeah. But uh, it ended up to be the violin. <laughs> and so... Uh, Again, until today, of course, I take violin extremely seriously and uh, uh, it would be a lie to say that I don't like the violin, but uh, 
why I say that in the heart I'm, I'm a cellist, in my next life definitely I will be a cellist, but it's not mm. about the instrument. Okay. Because I ended up not playing my favorite instrument, it has never been about a specific instrument. I'm not crazy about the instruments that I play. I'm crazy about music. Okay. And music is a very big uh, universe, right? And within the musical universe, there is a million things to discover. And it is maybe easier for me to be so excited about music and about all the different facets that music has, because it doesn't have to be the violin. Of course, if we, in my, in my case, violin was the first instrument that I learned. And if I want to say something musically, in the beginning, it was only the violin. So of course you need to master the instrument. Otherwise you cannot say anything. Otherwise it will sound terrible. And what can you say? If, if you are a poet and you have a terrible language, you have no control over the language. You cannot be a poet. If you have the most, even the most beautiful ideas and colors and uh, images, but if you, if you don't have, if you don't master the language, uh, you cannot do anything the same is for the music. It's an abstract art but it's a very specific language. So if you want to say something, if it's through your voice or through any kind of instrument, uh, or if it is what you do, Andrea, uh, mm. anybody who, who has uh, some, something to do with music, if it's a journalist, if it's a, um, a critic, if it's uh, somebody who is uh, working as a, uh, a manager or uh, for an agency or anything to do with music, the language has to be mastered. And that takes many, many years of professional study. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, leaving aside sports, so football, I know that you are a tennis player, a, a swimmer, and so there's a, a lot of uh, of activities that you need to print, but um, well, uh, did you uh, mind that you have left something, a word, uh, an ordinary word, um, besides your your uh, artistic life? If I live an ordinary life, yes. Bef uh, uh, outside, it's a good question. <laughs> But, uh, but Andrea, I travel with my tennis racket. <laughs> I, I always, br I bring my ordinary life in the luggage. I bring my favorite shampoos with me. I, uh, I get to travel with the person I love uh, most in my life besides my parents. It's my wife. So we travel together. Uh, we try to have as much ordinary life as it's possible. Uh, mm. But of, uh, we love, we have many different hobbies. Uh, we like to uh, experience many things outside of music. Uh, it is not just sport. We love the cinema. We love uh, uh, to go and uh, we are planning everything around the food. Yeah. We have been watching Massimo Bottura's uh, Facebook live uh, streams uh, <laughs> every day during quarantine time. <laughs> Uh, you know, he's a great Italian chef yeah. from uh, Osteria Francescana in Modena. Yeah. And uh, we were lucky. We tried for the last seven. Uh, I mean, I know Sarah, my wife, now for five mm -hmm. years. We've tried five years to get a table there. <laughs> and funnily enough, last week we got a table okay. for lunch. So we jumped into the car and drove to Modena from Vienna. <laughs> and we, we met Massimo and we told him that he is a, a great maestro for us yeah. and a great artist. So most of our day is planned. Now uh, I'm at home, we are at home in Vienna and uh, uh, next, uh, in the next room, Sarah is cooking. So cooking is a very, very big passion for us. Of course, when we travel, we, it's difficult to cook. So, but it's a lot is happening uh, uh, around food, around discovering, the different cultures, the different 
you know, all these travels that we, we are lucky to have, despite the concentration and the hours of rehearsals and of focus, and in the evening you need to give a uh, hundred or two hundred or a thousand percent on stage. So of course, it is not a completely ordinary life. But uh, as much as we can, we need to clear our head and to recharge our batteries. Uh, you need to let go. Actually, yesterday I played uh, two Beethoven sonatas, uh, number seven and number nine, C minor and the Kreutzer sonata. And I will be very honest with you, I have not been practicing uh, a lot at all. Uh, in fact, I have the last th three weeks, I have hardly touched the violin. And I was a little bit concerned because uh, I don't like to go. I mean, I never go on stage unprepared. And of course, I still had rehearsals and I started practicing a few days ago. But normally, this is not, not good enough for my standards. But um, it is the time of quarantine still. And uh, uh, there is a lot of things that I enjoy doing rather than being chained to the violin. Uh, because it is a kind of a jail when you decide to be a violinist or violist. Uh, uh, you are chained to it. And you have always the ghost telling you you should be working. All of you who are watching this now, you, you should be practicing. <laughs> but you shouldn't. Enjoy. Uh, and uh, it is something that I had to learn over the years to let go also of these ghosts that constantly give you the bad conscience that you should be practicing it all the time. And every moment that you don't practice, somebody else is practicing <laughs> and you are not. So you're becoming worse, but it's not like this. So of course we need to, to work a lot, but uh, it was funny because my wife, who is um, my biggest critic, uh, she told me that it was one of my best uh, Kreutzer sonatas yesterday because there was some kind of a freshness. And it is not because I, I haven't practiced. I mean, I've been practicing the Kreutzer and all the 10 Beethoven sonatas all my life and playing my 24 Paganini caprices never on stage, but at home. And she said, you should play less of these stupid Paganini caprices, <laughs> maybe sometimes, <laughs> and be more fresh when you go on stage. And um, there is uh, some kind of truth in it. We all need to listen and to learn, and there is not the right rule, there is not right or wrong, but we should all learn to listen to our own system, what is good for us, sometimes maybe to have a fresh approach and not to over-practice. I've been talking, because you mentioned tennis, I've been talking a lot also to, to great um, tennis players, uh, and they also said that this is a very significant thing when they go into the big tournaments. And the last two, three, four days, it's a big mistake if they, if they train a lot. Because all of them are great players. And it is only a matter of mindset. Mm. And, and you need to be fresh when you go into the game. Psychologically, you need to be fresh. You need to have this balance and a certain calmness. And if you are over-practiced, over-rehearsed, then your head is maybe also over-analyzing, over-occupied, and it's all about finding the right balance. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Well, and <clears throat> returning to... Uh to your uh, first steps in the artistic world, but not only the first steps, because you had, uh, you, you, before you talked about uh, Rostropovich, Mishamaisky, so you had a lot of friends and mentors and uh, helper. Well, um, how do you live uh, this, um, perspective well are you looking for uh, mentors for um, um, 
maestros. Uh, how do you, I, I mean, um, it's, it's a, a mentor, it's uh, fundamental to discover the talent and, and the develop, development of the talent. That's, it means that uh, a mentor uh, guides you to discover your talent but uh, not only it's it's um, he hands over uh, a tradition and an history i mean rostropovich was uh, was in contact with shostakovich i mean I, I, because i listened to your uh, quintet last year in the festival of shostakovich and now i think I could, what uh, why why uh, julian racklin has many mentors because it's the most wonderful thing that uh, we can uh, we can do it. Uh, this is how classical music the the continuation. Why uh, why are we still celebrating Beethoven and Mozart and Schubert and Brahms and uh, all these great uh, geniuses? Is because the tradition has always needs to be passed on from generation. To generation to generation we cannot and should not keep the secrets and the Stradivari and uh, and Guarneri and Amati and uh, all of these great masters in Cremona they didn't they took their secrets into the grave and you see the result now no musician can buy a, a great instrument because they are too expensive all of these instruments and the modern instruments are good but they are not as good, maybe, as if the great masters would have revealed all their secrets. Yeah. And I'm not going to tell you my, uh, some of my disappointing stories, but I've had a great deal of disappointing stories where I would ask great masters for help to reveal their secrets, yeah. to share their expertise, uh, to share their parts you know, for example, their music scores, their parts to, to give lessons and, uh, you know, to, to, to give away, to share, to pass over some of the knowledge. And the answer was no, do it yourself. <laughs> some of really famous artists. And I am strictly against that. This is why whoever wants to have my fingerings, my bowings, whatever, my markings, they can always have it. I think it is our duty to pass on everything that we know, all the experience. Now, my experience is, let's say, 32 years that I've been traveling and performing. So it's already some kind of experience. Uh, but of course, I think it is the most important thing and I can only encourage all the young uh, people to be, not to be scared, to approach your heroes, approach, write them, go to them, ask them questions. And the ones who will tell you to go away, they don't deserve it anyways. They don't deserve your attention. It's fine. You will have disappointments on the way, but you should not be afraid to approach them. I have always written to my heroes and uh, I've just went up to them when I was a nobody, went to the rehearsals, went up, said, can I play for you? I went to Leonard Bernstein. I went to every concert of Leonard Bernstein and always asked him, I want to play for you. And he said, next time, next time. He hugged me, he kissed me. <laughs> I, I was a little bit why is he kissing me anyways that's another story <laughs> but but um, I would go all the time to, to uh, and then one day after many many years of asking but maestro I want to play for you I want to play for you you are my big hero you are my inspiration one day he said come tomorrow at 12 o'clock I couldn't believe it Leonard Bernstein told me that I can play for him. This is incredible. So I went to the music friend. The next day I auditioned 
with my mom on the piano. And uh, uh, a week later, we had a letter or invitation for me to play with the Boston Symphony with Leonard Bernstein. Unfortunately, the concert never happened because he passed away. Because the concert was planned one and a half, two years in advance. But anyways, this is one of many stories to... Yeah. And I, I was in Paris a few days ago and I met one of the greatest living architects. Uh, uh, it's, it's a lady from Lebanon, from Beirut. Her name is um, Aline Asmar Aman. Uh, let me check exactly her name. And uh, she's the most fascinating uh, personality. Uh, she has just uh, done uh, the Hotel de Crillon, one of the great hotels in Paris. She has uh, done the whole architecture, inside architecture of the restaurant Jules Verne inside the Eiffel Tower. And uh, she's doing now the Rosewood Hotel in Venice. So she's doing a lot of things. She's a young, wonderful, one of the great living architects. And we started to talk. We had a dinner. We became friendly. And I said, how did you start your journey? And she said, you know, I was living in Lebanon. And then somehow I, my dream was to study in Paris, architecture and this. And I kept writing letters and this. And then my dream was to work for Karl Lagerfeld. And of course, everybody was laughing at her. A girl from Beirut, from Lebanon, she said, yeah, everybody wants to work for Karl Lagerfeld. She said, yeah, but I'm going to work with Karl Lagerfeld because I have a lot of ideas for him. And uh, she wrote him a letter. She showed him all of her ideas, her work, her expertise. She was still very young. And she said, I want to learn from you. And I have a lot of ideas for your project and this and that. And what do you think? He invited her. She went, she met him. He was fascinated by her. And from that moment, she did everything for Karl Lagerfeld. So she did the uh, Marie Antoinette suite at the Hotel de Curion. Lagerfeld asked her to do this suite. He asked her to do this and this and this. And then one step led to the next step. Of course, she's extremely talented, but the message is, don't be afraid mm. to approach your heroes. And I think that this is extremely important for us to not to be scared because we are always scared. My God, these people, they are untouchable. They live somewhere on a different planet and and we are just normal people. They are also normal people. They are very hardworking people. They are very obsessed with what they do. Like all of us, we are very obsessed. <laughs> like obsessed, hopefully in a good way, but it's kind of a little bit crazy what we do. No, to be a musician, you cannot be a completely normal person because there is no working hours Monday through Friday from 10 to 6 p.m. It doesn't exist. So, of course, we have a very, very strong focus uh, if, if, you know, to, do, to deal with these kind of people. <laughs> you cannot be normal because these people were not normal themselves. <laughs> so they require a lot of um, dedication. It's a choice in life to dedicate yourself to, to, to music, for example, or to anything else, to any other thing. But Definitely, I have always believed in learning. Until today, I approach my heroes. I ask, by now, I have the luxury to call my heroes my friends. So it becomes, it melts together into a friendship, into uh, learning from each other, collaborations. And I've always loved also to put my heroes together. So if I meet hero A and then I meet hero X and they don't know each other, they never met, I always want them to meet. <laughs> and uh, this gave me always a great joy. And then to step aside and to see that they... these people, 
which I inspire to meet that they never have met. And if they find a good chemistry, this brings me the utmost joy. It's another shape of, of your creativity. So it's, a, well, and, um, well, in about all, um, about um, turning back to see your uh, journey, we call it the hero journey, but it's, it's, a, uh, it's a life journey. What do you think? Can you recognize a sort of mission, of reason, of treasure that uh, bring you to, uh, to step by step in this journey? I think it's a school of life because uh, you learn how to, how to be because we all have very strong ideas. For example, when you spend so many hours working uh, and uh, working on a piece, you of course have very strong ideas about this piece. But then when you start, let's say it's a chamber music piece, then you meet the other musicians and each of these other musicians they have done the same work like you did and they also have their very clear idea what they want. And then you need to learn how to find compromises because it's chamber music, it's, it, it, it's a school of compromises, no? <laughs> and if you don't learn how to compromise, how to listen to other people, how to accept other people's ways of being. Uh, for example, for me, I learn a lot conducting because then I have a group of between 50 and 100 musicians. So this is also something, what happens? in an organism like an orchestra where every single individual has learned and studied music all their life and how to respect each of them and still how so always have the respect to each musician on the other hand have a very strong uh, way of convincing these great musicians to follow your ideas <laughs> as a conductor it's very, very interesting because you need to be a psychologist, you need to be a diplomat, you need to also learn from the orchestra because each orchestra has their own traditions, their own energy, their own sound. Uh, so at the same time learning as inviting the musicians to follow you and to be strong and to be soft at the same time. So. Yeah, what is the mission? The, the mission is it's a school of life. As uh, Francesco said before in his introduction, it teaches us a lot of things. How do we treat our friends, our musician friends? What do we learn? The respect. I think being a classical musician automatically teaches you a lot to have respect, to have, um, to be, uh, how do you say, to, 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 to have a lot of, um, you have to be humble, hum, uh, humility. Okay. Because we have so much humility in front of these great composers. And to master the instrument, take so much respect to the instrument. Because the instrument is showing us every day that we are nothing. We take the instrument, we sound like shit. Sorry most of the time <laughs> and and to sound good <laughs> how much work you need how much respect you need in front of this instrument in front of the piece that you're working on so it is automatically i think an advantage to maybe other professions that classical music is teaching us to have this respect but then of course dealing with other human beings uh, it, it's a wonderful mission and and to inspire other musicians. It, it has been a great mission to inspire, to help, to use. Now, 
I'm 45, I'm going to be 46, so after 35 years, um, and I don't mean it in an arrogant way, but to use the fact that I have access to the media, that I have some kind of uh, uh, access uh, or, 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 or my name is a little bit known. So to use that uh, status of prominence to help, to raise money, to, to do certain things like uh, I've been doing for UNICEF, to choose an organization that you believe in or to, to do something good. Uh, to help there's been and there always will be a lot of people that w we can help even if it's with small amounts it's not just money but music it also uh, can do so much for the souls of people my neighbor he has uh, he's already in his 90s he has cancer he cannot really walk outside and uh, I decided uh, to go and to visit his wife and him, just next door, neighbor, and to play for him. And he loves music, but he cannot go out. He's, yeah, I think he's 92, 93 years old, but his mind is totally clear. But his wife tells me he cannot do, he is depressed, he's frustrated. We can do so much. And it's not just a, a materialistic thing, but... I think music can, uh, can help. We can learn so much through music for our life. And we can help because yeah. music is medicine for the soul. Yes. Uh, what kind of man have you become through this journey? So talking about the thing that you just tell us, told us. It's uh, for my close friends and family and other people to say what I've become, the ones who know me from a long time. So maybe I'm the wrong person to ask, but mm. definitely I have, uh, uh, I don't consider uh, myself uh, finished with anything. I, I'm just starting. So the first 30 years have been a nice overture, <laughs> introduction. And now I feel like uh, the, the, the main, maybe, maybe not the first theme, but maybe the, the, the second theme, <laughs> or maybe the development section, <laughs> if you t talk in sonata form language, yeah? But uh, I'm not at the recapitulation. I have not <laughs> arrived at the recapitulation yet. So let's Great. say I'm going through the transmission, through the development section. So mm -hmm. yes, uh, I try to absorb everything like a sponge, you know, that absorbs mm -hmm. everything. And uh, on the other hand, also at my age, I choose my friends very carefully, more carefully than when I was very young. Because the time, I only want to be with people and spend time with people that bring wonderful energy, <laughs> that bring a lot of sunshine. And that doesn't mean that we are always happy. People that bring substance, real people, and that are not friends because I'm Julian Rachlin. It's not interesting for me. These people, when you are successful, they pretend to be your friends. They want to be around you. The moment you are less successful, they are gone in one second. So just to be sensitive, to choose your friends, your circle of friends, carefully, okay. so that to minimize the human disappointments and not to be, uh, so that the people don't take advantage of you. I think it's important. And uh, on the other hand, still believe in humanity that the people, every person has goodness inside. Although I don't believe that every person in the world is a wonderful person, but I believe that most are. So, and uh, 
yeah, this journey is teaching us, all of us, if we stay curious. Because of course, the older you get, the more things you don't want to change. I think, yeah, we have a lot of very young people here listening. And uh, when you are young, you can change. You can go this direction, this, and um, more, I think. With age, you have certain habits that you don't want to change uh, the older you get. But still, we need to have this little cell in our being in our brain in our heart in our existence that should always be ready for change and i have another wonderful quote that i received from rostropovich but it's not rostropovich's quote it's uh, francesco knows this one but still i want to share it because mm. it's wonderful and it reminds me uh, every day i'm being reminded on, of this it, it's a very simple uh, it's a one sentence which Rostropovich told me, but Sergei Prokofiev told this to Rostropovich. And this is again, this is the generations, the passing over. It's part of this, what we discussed. So Prokofiev told the young Rostropovich, young man, you have to clean and brush your musical taste as often as you brush your teeth. Okay. You think now, what does this mean? In the beginning, I didn't understand. Mm. So I needed a few minutes to understand. Mm. So what he meant is, we need to clean our taste every day. That means if I think that today, I know exactly how the interpretation of a Bach sonata or partita or Bach has to be played like this. This is the one and only way. And of course, if I go on stage today, I it's need important. to know that this is the only way, but it's only today. Tomorrow, I should think again. I should brush the taste. And tomorrow, I am allowed to change my opinion completely. We are allowed to change our opinions. So, if I arrive at a point one day and I take again the Beethoven sonatas or, or, or the concertos or whatever, symphonies, and that's why it's good to take clean scores every once in a while, you know? I've played, I don't know, 500 Mendelssohn concertos in my life or more, I don't know. But take a, I like to take a clean score and to pretend that I have never played it because you will always find something in these great masterpieces. And this is the cleaning part. This is the brushing the teeth part. And this is, a, I think it sounds very banal and very simple, but it's wonderful because we think we know how a piece needs to sound. We have a certain expectation when we, when we play ourselves or when we go to a concert and we listen and then we say, this was terrible. But maybe it was not terrible. Maybe it was just different than what we are used to. <laughs> maybe. Maybe it was terrible, but maybe it was not. Maybe it was just something completely against our system. But... It's interesting. We should leave this curiosity and we should leave the possibility open to ourselves to change our way of thinking and to constantly try to question ourselves. Great. Great. Thank you. Well, um, uh, what are the experiences that have forged you the most? I mean, uh, talent bring, uh, brings some facility, ease, that, that is helped by talent, but uh, which leads sometimes to overcoming certain difficulty, difficulties. 
But in a recent interview uh, for Amadeus, from, <laughs> you say that in life, everything you want to do as your best is always difficult and that uh, you have to get suspicious if something is immediately easy, which is the progress of this uh, consciousness. Yes, I mean, what was your question? Well, was, um, first of all, which are the experiences that have forged you the most? But uh, uh, about uh, your, your experience as a talent, I mean, um, how do you have to approach your talent? Because it's not about a, a question of easiness or uh, facility, but uh, if you say uh, mm, alert, if you, uh, if you don't find difficulties in what are you doing, there's something's wrong. So I want to uh, merge the, the two aspects. Yes, I mean, talent, what, what does it mean, talent? It's maximum 3% if you are uh, for me. <laughs> If you are an extraordinary talent, that's three percent. That's and if the ninety-seven percent of the rest of it is not there, the talent goes down the drain. It it, it disappears. So this is always a danger for very talented people because they think, oh, they look around and they are much more talented. Everything comes much quicker to them, much easier to them, and. Um, and then they think that they don't need to do anything because they are so talented and they are so smart and, and everything is so wonderful. But um, that's why talent for me is 3% and 97% is, is work, it's determination, it's curiosity, it's discipline, it's um, fascination, it's... Uh, It's ready to, to be really hard on yourself. We always try to approach uh, something that we never achieve. It sounds very, very negative and pessimistic when I say that we will, we, all of us, we will never achieve what is in our mind. So I have a certain interpretation in my mind and I can guarantee you that I will never, ever achieve it. So that sounds very sad, <laughs> but it's wonderful. And this is the whole essence, why we keep doing what we're doing, is because we will never achieve it. But we always try to come close, as close as possible, to this moment of glory, of... Uh, of perfection in every way, as close as possible. And if in a year, now it's of course the big crisis, but if in a year I play 120 concerts, if I experience this two or three times, that is an amazing year from the 120 concerts. If I experience that I got pretty close to this idea, and um, yeah, so I mean, this, this talent is really for nothing if, if, if everything else, I think one should forget about one's talent. You yes. know, the talent comes when you are on stage, when you have done everything, all the 97%, then don't worry, your talent will make the difference. It will make the difference. It will set you apart from the other people but nothing more than that. And um, yeah, when you say, uh, when you quoted uh, the interview that uh, I don't like when something is easy, of mm. course, I mean, uh, it's easy to, to drink a glass of wine, it's easy, but to meet the people who make the wine and to speak to them, it is just as incredible and fascinating to do this. Each grape, they are so worried if the frost comes in before the harvest, it's a catastrophe. 
the weather, the change of weather, when comes the rain and this, then they pick every grape. Then the whole process. I mean, they are completely crazy people, these winemakers. It's just one of the examples. And then we just open the wine and we drink, we don't think. And we even talk, we don't even take a moment to appreciate the process and the people behind it. And I think this is fascinating. And this goes for everything in life. No? I sit on the table here. Somebody made this table. And somebody put a lot of love and passion and knowledge. They had to study carpentry and all these kind of things. I mean, am I, the, it's an attitude. <laughs> it's an attitude in life. Do you care or do you not care? Do you think, ah, it's no problem. I have to play a little piece. Ah, it's fine. I've done it so many times. Or do you really care? And you say, I am playing. Even though it's for the 2,739th time. But for me, and I've always said it, my religion is music. And if you take religion seriously, then when I go on stage, this is my prayer. I don't do I believe in God? I don't know what, what, it is, what it is. But for me, my God is the moment when I go on stage. Because this is an incredible feeling. To feel the energy of the hall, to feel the hall itself, the history of the hall, of the space, then what is happening on stage, and then to be connected to the composer, and most of them have been dead for two, three hundred years. So, I mean, this whole combination is pretty religious, no? <laughs> and then to play divine music. I think all of these aspects uh, bring you to the conclusion that the word easy, what is easy? If you, if you want to do something really well, the word easy for me doesn't exist. It must seem easy. <laughs> That's something different. The moment I, I step on stage, it has to seem effortless. As if it is the most natural thing. Like we take a shower. It's not so difficult to take a shower, right? <laughs> but... It's very hard to make it seem effortless. Okay. So, yeah, I've come to the con con conclusion that, yeah, to, to make a really good coffee, and this is one of my hobbies, is to make coffee. I'm learning it with, with the barista. Uh, he's coming regularly when we are in Vienna, and I'm taking co uh, uh, classes in coffee making. And okay. it's a whole science. To make a good coffee, I've been training for five years now. Uh, the water, how hard or soft? The beans, how are the beans roasted? Which kind of beans? Are they single origin? From which farm do the beans come? How many grams? What is the grinder? Which kind of grinder for the beans? Which kind of co coffee machine? The size of the grind changes many times during the day because the humidity and everything changes. So you always have to adjust the grind of, of your coffee, etc., etc., etc. Everything for me is fa it's fascinating for me and I don't like to do it halfway. Of course, I will never be a professional barista. But it brings me joy to do a good coffee. And to do a good coffee at home, I want to learn how to do a good coffee. To be a good amateur. To play tennis, I take lessons with professionals. Why? Not because I have the illusion to become a great tennis player. But I want to feel good when I play tennis. I want to have a good technique so that I don't hit the ball somewhere. And that... Uh, 
it's no fun. So I like to, to work with professionals, even for my hobbies. And uh, it's not so expensive. You don't need to be a millionaire to do this. <laughs> it doesn't matter what is your passion, but I like to get information from people that have spent their life or, you know, dedicated to this one particular theme. It's uh, one of my purpose, so I'm talking to you. Well, <laughs> for the last question, well, my last question, then we, we can uh, open the question to the, the guys of the academy. Well, uh, and um, a question that is about the uh, atmosphere and the mission of the Mac Academy. Uh, you have already talked about this, about uh, how you share your treasure, uh, your wisdom that you have gained with others. Like, um, thinking about these, those young musicians that uh, are now listening to you, uh, how much is it important for you to share your uh, your talent, your uh, your journey, the, the, the milestone of your journey? It's very important to share the message of my journey. That's why I immediately was fascinated. Congratulations, Francesco, what you have put up and all of you who, for the, to the whole team. I think it's really wonderful and I hope that uh, a lot of people are going to do projects like this to inspire the young generation to, to, to be active in whatever your, whatever your ideas are. There is so much that you can do and not to be afraid of, uh, of doing it, of uh, following your dreams and to make, to, to, to making your dreams uh, reality. I've always had very irrational dreams completely irrational but I try to take to put between 20 and 30 percent of my irrational dreams into reality and that is this 20 to 30 percent is a lot because my dreams are very very big and irrational <laughs> quite crazy but 20 to 30 percent it's okay. It's a lot of work. It's a crazy amount of work. But if you set yourself a high standard, then 20 to 30%, it's like 2,000% for other people who don't have this. So it's an interesting, uh, interesting element for me, definitely passing on uh, whatever it is, life experience, knowledge, information, uh, inspiration, all of this. Uh, I think uh, whoever you want to, to learn from, approach them. They will always, they should always find five minutes or 10 minutes of their time. And if they don't, then something is wrong with them. <laughs> <laughs> Something humanly is wrong with them mm. if they will not be willing to share a few minutes of their life. And uh, I think that uh, this is the only way that le specifically classical music can survive. That's the only, only chance, the, uh, the only ways for the young generation to learn from the old generation. And then, but then not just to learn, learning is only one element. Then you need to have your own courage to make your own mistakes <laughs> and to make your own decisions and to have your own very clear ideas and to have your own, to form your own very strong personalities and not to be afraid of that. Of course, never to ignore the past, to know everything about the past, what you can, because the past is very rich. 
that's hundreds of years of rich history behind us. So to know everything about the past, but then to have the courage to add your own stamp, your own personality. And this is the way to the future. This is how it has always been. The strong personalities are the ones that take the classical music forward into the next epoch without ruining what the composers want. Never to ruin the, you know, everything what they have given us. All the information that we can have, we need to know this information from the composers. We need to read, we need to learn. How was the humor? How was the smell? Imagine the smell in Mozart's time. Vienna was, and Salzburg, it was stinking. There were the sewages, it was crazy. When you read the uh, letters of Mozart, uh, it's so much fun actually. His humor was totally different than today's humor. And I think we all need to know this and to put this into our music, but also not to be afraid to add our own personality because uh, the great composer, I was lucky to work with some of wonderful living composers, but one of them who just died recently, Penderecki, he told me, I don't care what I wrote here. I need you to give me a convincing interpretation. Please convince me. He said, why are you playing pianissimo here? I said, because Maestro, he wrote, you wrote pianissimo, you wrote three piano. He said, this was for Anne Sophie Mutter, this was not for you. <laughs> I said, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> he said, why you play Consordino? I said, because it's written Consordino. He said, it's not for you. Your Consordino doesn't convince me. Use a different Sordino or take it away. <laughs> they want to be. And I think people like Mozart, like, you know, certain, okay, Beethoven, I think he wants to be quite strict. You know, his typical always break of everything. <laughs> he wanted to break everything. Sforzato pianissimo. Everything breaks and everything at the wrong moment. Uh, he was a true revolutionary. But mm. it is up to us to be really full of respect and knowledge, but then to have the courage to, to do our own thing. I think the composers need us to bring life to their music. And we should not be afraid of putting our own ideas and visions into the interpretations. Great. It's, uh, it's been a, a great lesson, I mean, uh, uh, of wisdom and, uh, and um, humanity, also that great uh, artistic point of view. Thank you, thank you. But I don't know, Francesco, if you had something to add, some question from you that you... Maybe I would, uh, I would leave the, the microphone to some of yeah. our musicians. Thank you, Julian. I was sure that would have been something really enriching all of us, because I know when I talk to you and when I... We, we do music together. I had the chance last year for the first time and it was so enriching. And I know how you talk in different ways. And so thank you so much. It's really important to me and to all of us, I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you, Francesco. Yes, if you have any questions, please. I have another few minutes. My wife is going to kill me because she cooked beautiful dinner for many hours. So. <laughs> no. I think Fermin, you had something. Yes. Hello. <laughs> Hello, Julian. Nice. Hi, Hello. Fermin. Yeah, it's nice to meet Hi. you. First of all, I uh, I would like to thank you for this wonderful talking and opportunity that you give to us for yeah to meet you. 
Uh, I would like to ask you because I'm doing a, a research about how to enhance your music performance. I'm a violinist as well, and I'm studying in the Netherlands. And yeah, I will kindly ask you, do you have some recommendations of how to enhance your music performance? And I also would like to ask you, do you have, how do you prepare yourself for big performances? Oh my God, we need another few hours huh, <laughs> to answer this question. Uh, enhance your musical performance. This is a very general question, right? What do you mean exactly by enhance your musical performance? Because we all want to enhance our musical yeah. performance every day, right? Yes. <laughs> so we do everything what we can to enhance your musical performance. Um, Preparation, as I said, the day of the concert is too late to prepare, right? Forget about preparing the day or one day before. <laughs> you need to, timing is very important. You need to know what is in half a year, what is in one year, what is in three months, what is in two weeks. Timing is very, very important. Timing in terms of not just playing, but in terms of preparation. Everything is about preparation. And then definitely of the mind. Yeah. And in my experience, purely violinistically, it helps very much if the left hand is very, very light. If you manage to have a very, very light left hand in the concert. It's not easy, huh? but uh, it should be light as a feather. And, and you should be very, very balanced and very calm on stage. It's pretty impossible, right? Yeah. I know that, but this, this is the ideal. This yeah, is the ideal. Do you have some recommendations of breathing things, exercises, or do you, I don't know, do you prepare yourself with some breathing exercises or I don't know, how do you prepare your mind to that mindset of, of I like, of I, both, I like uh, meditating. I've gotten into meditation during Corona, corona times. It helped me a lot to find a balance. So any type of meditation is good. I went through a course, it's called Jiva Online. Uh, this was, I think it's uh, Z-I-V-A, Jiva Online. And, but there is uh, thousands of meditation courses which help you, teach you how to breathe, how to be aware of all of your senses. Um, this was great for me. Otherwise... Sport is good for me because it helps me to regulate my heartbeat and the heartbeat should not be crazy because then we will, with the nerves, we will not be able to control our nerves. So of course, sport, regular sport helps to, to be calm and, you know, and the mental, the mental side is very important because yes, we say we need to be nervous, otherwise the, uh, the performance is uh, going to be boring. No, I don't believe in being nervous. I believe in being zero nervous <laughs> because only then I can be exciting on stage. If I am crazy nervous, I am paralyzed on stage. This makes my performance worse. I believe in being calm on stage. And enhance the performance if you don't, I always call it choreography. The people try to dance whilst playing. They are moving their legs, they are moving like, I think that be, uh, how do you say, underneath the belt is our base. These are the, the legs. They should never move. It's like a structure of the house. This is very important. 
the upper body absolutely can be can, can and should be free to rotate but not the legs they have to be this is the earth this is the basic otherwise the sound disappears into your legs and i call it choreography but we are not dancers if you do a performance where you dance and play violin then yes but no dancing otherwise <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Julian. Pleasure. I have a, another question if you have time. Um, yes, please. Thanks. <laughs> Are you taught about uh, cleaning music taste before and always have a, a fresh look uh, on things? But I wanted to ask uh, when you have uh, to learn uh, a new piece like from zero. Is there something you do first? Like, how do you like to get to know the music in the first place? Well, I take the score, I analyze the score, but really the score, even if it's, a, you know, whatever it is, please take the score. Don't just take your violin, violin part. It's ridiculous, you know? Uh, to, to learn a piece of music, whatever it is, unless it's a... Uh, you know, solo work for violin. But if it's a concerto, take the orchestra score and analyze what are the important themes, what are the important instruments. You need to know the whole score. Otherwise, you are not going to be uh, uh, playing it like a real musician. Then you will be just uh, like uh, an ignorant soloist who has no idea about the sim even a concerto. It's a symphonic piece with a solo instrument. Absolutely. But I definitely take the score, I make the complete analysis of the score, and then I try to learn about the history, about the piece, so try to research as much as you can about the piece specifically, whatever is from the composer, friends of the composer, what was written about the piece, you know, anything what you historically can find, and then also recordings, but please don't be influenced by recordings. Don't try to copy anything. Just listen to the recordings in a neutral way, in an informative way. All kind of historic recordings, old recordings, modern recordings. I like doing that, but then I like to take it away and to forget about all of these recordings, you know? And then in the end, you need to find your own way so that the people will speak about your recording. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, yes, hi. My name is Monse. Um, I would like to ask you, um, how do you manage um, the negative thoughts when you are playing either in the practice session or in concert? But I assume that perfectionism also implies being kind of negative with yourself, saying, oh, this chord could be nicer, or oh, that was nice, but maybe not perfect, or these kind of things. It's difficult, because especially in concert, when something goes wrong, you need to switch off immediately as if nothing went wrong. Otherwise, you have no chance. If something goes wrong in, in the concert, during the concert, the second after it goes wrong, you need to be professional and you need to, you need to completely forget that you just screwed up something. And you have to accept and embrace it because the people are not going to judge you on this one little mistake that you did. Because what you do is you're going on stage to tell a story, to share your interpretation and your vision and your ideas and your emotion, your intellectual and your emotional uh, thoughts of a piece. And the mistakes that we all do, they cannot destroy the overall message. So you cannot let these stupid mistakes become Hmm. control take control over you 
always think that you are you are there to say something you want to say something otherwise don't go on stage why are we musicians and the negative thought at home at home they have to be negative so but they have to be negative and you have to make them so they become positive right so you work on the solutions when we are fighting with somebody we need to find a solution to finish the fight so when you fight with your instrument or with your hands or with this you need to find solutions if you don't have solutions you need to ask somebody you need to ask a doctor a musical doctor for solutions <laughs> but i'm sure you 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 find your own solutions okay thank you very much anybody else maybe i want to ask you julian when this passion for the conducting came to you i mean your mother is conducting teacher and uh, of course you you got close to since when you were a child to very very important conductors and uh, very friend with some of them a very good friend with some of them and of course it has been something very close to you all your life but when came uh, became clear to you that you you would have liked to experience to to enlarge your yeah your uh, your journey your creativity or it happened very naturally because the chamber orchestra started inviting me without conductor just to play a violin concerto and suddenly there was no conductor so in a mozart concerto or something there was no conductor so i arrived and i was standing there whilst the orchestra was playing the tutti and then the concert master of the orchestra said uh, julian do you have some ideas w would you like to work with us if you have any suggestions or ideas i said you want my ideas nobody ever asked me for my ideas because being a soloist you have always a conductor and the conductor is leading the rehearsal and he it's the Yes, you are the soloist, but you are not the one who is sharing the ideas with the musicians, with the, with the orchestra. So it was very interesting for me because, yes, of course, I had a lot of ideas, but I never could or had the possibility to share them. And so I started sharing some of my ideas and I saw that uh, the musicians, they, for some strange reason, they they uh, were ready to try out these ideas and uh, they took these ideas and and then i thought uh, so i did it more and more more and more projects like this without conductor but um it is a very very specific and a big mistake of many soloists also historically many instrumentalists who have performed with great orchestras, with great conductors all their lives, they come to a point where they want themselves to conduct. And they assume, because they have played with all of these great orchestras and because they worked with all of these great conductors, that automatically they can step in front of an orchestra as conductors. And this is the biggest mistake. And this is why maybe 99.7% of all instrumentalists that uh, start conducting they are not good conductors and I'm not saying that I am the 0.3% I'm just saying that I'm trying to uh, I'm trying to do it differently than many many of these great solos did because they simply were not ready to go to school again and to start from zero, because conducting is a profession that has nothing to do with being an instrumentalist. To lead an orchestra is a completely different language, and you need to study many, 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 many years 
until you master it. It is a totally different instrument. An orchestra is an instrument. And to step in front of this instrument, you need to be ready. You need to be in command, in control of this instrument. And that means you need to know a thousand times more than everybody else of these great musicians. You need to be so well informed and prepared and you need to have the technique to step in front of these musicians. And they will smell this in the, within the first 30 seconds of the first rehearsal. The orchestra will know. They will do like this or like this. And when it's like this, they will eat you alive. So the profession of a conductor is not to be underestimated. Ah, I'm a wonderful musician. They will play, I will wave my hands. Big mistake. Ladies and gentlemen, I have to go. I would love to speak another few hours to all of you. So, thank you, Julian. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, everybody, to have been here today. And uh, we will meet on Monday at 6 p.m. for the last meeting with uh, Moni Ovadia. And uh, yes, I wish you a very nice evening, very nice meal. Julian, for sure, has something special waiting for him. I hope you all and uh, have a nice weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Francesco. And good luck with everything. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Auguri. Thank you, everybody. Tanti auguri. Grazie. Bye. Thank you.